believe it. We're here at the end of Tulip. I know Pat is so excited, she can't stand herself. So <laughs> she is really happy, I can tell you. So, you know, you, uh, you think about this topic and, 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 you know, of all the five, you say, oh, well, this one's the no-brainer. We don't have to even really think about this one. And because there, there, there's, this one does uh, is a thorny issue after all. But I mean, this is the big question, and, and this is a huge uh, Google searched question by a lot of believers who have a lot of anxiety and worry and concern about their status with God. Um, you know, not their Facebook status, but their status with God, which is the most important thing, right? Can I lose my salvation? That is the big thing that people are worried about. And, and even people who grow up in, in churches that believe in eternal security, they still are concerned about their salvation. You know, am I saved? And, and that is, you know, that is a, a real concern that people have. Um, now, some people, of course, uh, refer to this doctrine as the perseverance of the saints. Um, you know, in Baptist life, we, we have this phrase that we like to use, once saved, always saved, uh, I think, which is, um, uh, you know, that's, that's the popular phrase, but a little bit simplistic when it comes to the doctrine as you look at it. Um, we usually like to talk about, at least from a, from a theological perspective, the eternal security of the believer and the perseverance of the saints. So both of those really two sides of one coin. Um, so that's the, that's the one that we're looking at. That's the last one. We've looked at total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and now we get to this last one um, that was in response to the Arminians uh, in, the, in the Council of Dort, uh, this fifth head of, of doctrine here, and that's the perseverance of the saints. Um, the Arminians, I'm not sure whether Jacob Arminius would, would agree with this or not. He was more Calvinist than the Arminians like to admit. Uh, but his followers, at least, believed in apostasy. They believed that you can walk away from, fall away from, forsake, desert the faith. You can, you can leave Christ, if you will. So that's what they believed. And so the Calvinists um, at Dort responded to that with this doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. So let's look at it, this fifth point. Um, this doctrine follows logically, it, it, you know, again, like the dominoes. Uh, uh, conclusion, after we've looked at total depravity, unconditional election, irresistible grace, if individuals are incapable of responding to the gospel, that's T. And if God predetermines by decree which individuals he's going to elect, that's U for salvation or damnation. Remember, we've called that doctrine what? Duped. Duped, right? The divine, unilateral predetermination of eternal destinies. So I know that's a funny name or a funny acronym, but it's an accurate one because that's what they believe. And if God irresistibly calls, that's the I in TULIP, the elect of salvation, then those elected individuals will be divinely enabled to persevere to ultimate redemption, or we call that glorification, right? The third stage in salvation, justification is the front end, sal sanctification is the ongoing, and then glorification at the coming of Christ, where we're made to be like Him. So, that's the fifth point. And how did we get there? Well, uh, I've got I up there, but I mean P. Uh, Augustine, he's the one who brought into Christianity these concepts of total inability and unconditional election because of his uh, focus on Pelagius and his argument over infant baptism. Um, and remember that he extrapolated what happens with babies um, which, by the way, he believed in baptismal regeneration. He extrapolated that to everybody, adults as well, in his duped doctrine. And nobody prior to that, of course, held to that view. Now, in his attempt to avoid um, all these centuries of Christian teaching, he redefined free will in Stoic terms. 
And remember we talked about how the modern Calvinists call that compatibilism. It's non-free free will. I know that is, doesn't make sense and neither does their doctrine. But that's what they call it. Uh, and then he concluded, of course, that God micromanages and manipulates the circumstances so that everybody is going to do what God wants them to do. Um, and they call that, of course, now irresistible grace. And he ultimately deduced limited atonement from his stoic view of divine determinism because God gets everything he wants, so therefore he must not want everybody to be saved because not all are saved. Again, these, this guy was trained in rhetoric, trained in logic, and so he scripture. <laughs> and so what he does is he tries to take his argument and go back to the scripture and try to make it all fit. So he's the one that starts all this foolishness. And then another doctrine that emerged later after T.U. and I in his, in his uh, teaching course uh, was the perseverance of the saints. Actually, the L was the last one in his evolution of doctrine. But the perseverance of the saints. So here was how this developed. Remember, I'm, I'm taking you back and taking you back through what he came up with. So <clears throat> he observed something that we all observe. That some people start out in the faith, but they don't finish. Right? I mean, if they fall away. And that is observable. I mean, you can't argue against that. There are some people who will come forward, make a profession of faith, get baptized, and, you know, whether it's six months or six years later, then all of a sudden you can't find them, and maybe they're back living the way they used to live, and you're like, well, you know, how do you explain that? So he's looking at something, and he's trying to explain it, and so he says that some are going to follow through, but others fall away. So what could explain the difference since both possess the Holy Spirit? Now that's an assumption on his part, right? Because he believes in baptismal regeneration. He believes in the duped doctrine so that God's already chosen them, pre-selected them, and elected them. So therefore they're saved. So, you know, if both of them possess the Holy Spirit, how, how do you explain people falling away? Well, he came up with the idea, again, logically, because you can't find this in Scripture, right, uh, that God has got to give a second gift of grace called perseverance. So it's a gift that God gives, a second gift. Now, the Charismatics believe in a second gift, but it's a different kind, right? But, but he believed in a second gift called perseverance. And the gift of perseverance is only given to some baptized infants. And without this second gift of grace... A baptized Christian with the Holy Spirit is not going to persevere and ultimately is not going to be saved. Now, again, I'm not advocating for this. This is Augustine, okay, just so you're, you're clear. That's what he believed. So, with this gift, of course, the person will persevere to the end. That was his belief. Now, how did we get there in more modern times? What did Calvin say? Well, let's look at his institutes, and he has a whole section on perseverance. And he says, this is the only reason why some persevere to the end, and others, after beginning their course, fall away. Notice the similarity in the uh, description here. Perseverance is the what? It's a gift. Okay, It's the gift of God, which he does not lavish promiscuously on all, but imparts to whom he pleases. Now that fits logically with their doctrine, right? I mean, it completely fits with their doctrine of duped. You know, the divine unilateral predetermination of eternal destinies of some for salvation and some for damnation. These for salvation. These are the elect. God's already set the course for these people before he decreed the world into existence. He, he, by his eternal decree, before the world was spoken, He's determined that some will persevere and they will get this gift, right? That's what he believed. He says if it's asked how the difference arises, why some steadily persevere and others prove deficient in steadfastness, we can give no other reason that the Lord, by his mighty power, strengthens and sustains the former so that they perish not, while he does not furnish the same assistance to the latter, but leaves them to 
be monuments of instability. So essentially, God loves some people. God doesn't love other people enough to give them, <laughs> you know, the gift of perseverance and help them out. Because you read the Bible, God killed a lot of people, destroyed cities. Yeah, that's true. It, because of judgment. We're not talking about people who are sinners. We're talking about people who are professing to be saved. So anyway, here, here let's uh, let's keep moving with the Westminster Confi Confession here. This is uh, something that Baptists have patterned confessions of faith after, uh, and so here's how they put it: They whom God hath accepted in His beloved, effectually called, okay, irresistible grace, and sanctified by His Spirit, can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally. Saved, and there are the scripture references. This perseverance of the saints depends not upon their own free will, but upon the immu uh, immutability of, de of the decree of election. Again, this goes back to their doctrine, right? Flowing from the free and unchangeable love of God the Fa of God the Father, a very selective love, we might add. Upon the e efficacy of the merit and intercession of Jesus Christ, the abiding of the Spirit, the seed of God within them and the nature of the covenant of grace, from all which ariseth also the certainty and the infallibility thereof. In other words, it's a done deal. God's already decreed it, and these people will make it to the end. So, but notice how it's perseverance of the saints. The doctrine is tied back to duped. I just want you to see that, and I want to keep it there. Now, here, contrast that a little bit with our Baptist faith and message from 2000. Article 5, God's purpose is grace. This is the second part of it. The first part talks about election. The second part says, all true believers endure to the end. Those whom God has accepted in Christ and sanctified by His Spirit will never fall away from the state of grace, but shall persevere to the end. Believers will fall into sin through neglect and temptation, whereby they grieve the Spirit, impair their graces and comforts, and bring reproach on the cause of Christ and temporal judgments on themselves. Yet... They shall be kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Quoting 1 Peter chapter 1 there and verse 5. So uh, that's our Baptist faith and message. Okay? A little similar to it, but a little different, I think, as well. Um, you don't have the focus on duped <laughs> there, do you? So a little bit different. Now, here's the thing. We, we use the same biblical vocabulary but we use a different doctrinal dictionary. And again, their starting point for the perseverance of the saints is this decree of election, this duped doctrine. And so the perseverance of the saints is, who's it on? You or God? It's all on God, according to the Calvinist, right? The Reformed theology, Reformed position, because none of salvation's up to you. Not even exercising faith and receiving Salvation is a gift. Okay, um, so here's a couple of guys that basically are making this point. Right, it's it's all about God and God's role in keeping you. Those who have been effectually called by God, that's irresistible grace, have been reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit to endure to the end. Uh, he likes a different term, the preservation of the saints, because he wants to show God's role in it. And to their credit, everything they do is about the glory of God. However, they go to the extreme of taking you out of the equation, right? Which Scripture does not, and we're going to see that very clearly here in just a moment. All right, here's another guy, and I, I haven't quoted him the whole time, and I should have, because John MacArthur is one of the big dogs in the Calvinist world, right? He's on the radio every day. I, you know, I don't know why I haven't quoted him up to this point, but here's, uh, here's his, his take on it, and, I, and I'll spend a couple of slides on him. Uh, it's the most important component of salvation, he says. Because if salvation were not permanent, he connects it back to what? Then the doctrine of election would be called into question. See, you, you got to connect all, all this. It, again, it's, it, it, it's like dominoes. They're all connected, right? 
And so if you call into question the doctrine of election, the doctrine of justification will be called into question, the doctrine of sanctification will be called into question, the doctrine of glorification will be called into question. He's running through the list in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 30. You get it. The calling of God will be called into question, and therefore the work of the Father and the Son and the Spirit will all be called into question as well. And so what makes the whole of the doctrines of salvation come together and stay together is the eternality of salvation, the perseverance of of the saints. But again, where's the accent for the Calvinist? It's all on God. It's all on God. The eternal security of the believer is all on God. Now, uh, another guy that we've quoted before is um, John Piper. Quoted him a lot. Very thoughtful, very scripture oriented guy. And the young people love him. Uh, you know, they all go hear him at Passion. I saw when we were doing our Sunday school uh, party uh, Friday night that there was an advertisement for passion. So the college group is going to go down there and they're going to hear this guy. And they're going to fall more in love with this guy. And they're going to say, oh, well, I'm, I'm Calvinist too because this guy is so popular. Uh, and he gets to speak to all those college students down there. I don't think they ever hear a contrarian voice when it comes to the doctrines of grace and Calvinism. But anyway, he says, we've seen before the ironclad chain of divine works, same thing John MacArthur was quoting, those whom he predestined he also called, those whom he called he also justified, those whom he justified he also glorified. What is evident from this verse is that those who are effectually called, what's that? Again, that's Calvin code word for irresistible grace. Those who are effectually called in the hope of salvation will indeed persevere to the end and be glorified. And then he goes again and connects it to election. These are promises of God rooted in unconditional election in the first place and in the sovereign, converting, preserving grace that we have seen before. So this is, this is all the work of God. The perseverance of the saints is all the work of God. That's according to the Calvinists. So here it is, just to kind of sum it up real quick because i got some thorny issues we've got to tackle today so I'm trying to get this out of the way up front but here's their system they you know God loves a predetermined set of individuals the elect enough to call them and save them and though God shows love for all humanity through his common grace we've looked at Matthew 5 he causes the rain to fall and the sun to shine on the just and the unjust he tells us to love our enemies God does love his enemies Romans 5 right we were enemies at one time <laughs> Okay, doesn't love his enemies, some of them, enough to save them. He doesn't savingly love the non-elect enough to draw them by irresistible grace, break down their resistance, regenerate them against their will, essentially because he breaks their will, and give them the gift of faith. So it follows then that only the predetermined elect who are irresistibly called, regenerated, and given the gift of faith are the ones who are going to persevere to final salvation. All right, now let's get to what the Scripture says. All right, I've kind of taken you through that uh, pretty quickly because I want to get to some thorny issues here and see what we can do with them. I don't think we've got enough time to, to obviously do it right, but let's see what, uh, what it says here. I, I, I think when you look at it, you've got... and Melanie, you, you reminded me last week about the fact that we have in the scriptures when we talk about this whole doctrine of salvation, you've got this tension. Remember, we started when we talked about at the very beginning, and I'm going to kind of close the loop here at the end, about the fact that you've got the truth of divine sovereignty and you've got the truth of human responsibility and somehow... They work together in the process of salvation, and we don't quite, you, ca you can't resolve that tension. And the Calvinist tries to. He says, I'm, go I'm going all the way to divine sovereignty, and I'm taking human responsibility out of it, okay? And their claim is, is that the Pelagian just throws it all over on human responsibility. He's free to do whatever he wants to, accept Jesus anytime he wants to. Doesn't need the operating Holy Spirit to convict or draw. Doesn't need any of that stuff. He can do it on his own. That's on the other end of the spectrum. But even in this doctrine, we see this same tension, I think. Because many scriptures promise that God's going to keep you. 
eternally secure. Okay, now we're going to look at them. But on the other hand, there's a lot of scripture that tells you, you better press on. <laughs> you better keep at it. You better hold fast to him who overcomes, Jesus says over and over in Revelation. And if you don't, so you've got this tension in Scripture. And I'm going to show it to you, okay? And you can make your own decisions about it, but you've got both ends of these two poles here. The telephone poles with the wire between. Remember that picture I showed y'all? You've got this tension between the eternal security of the believer that God gives you and the perseverance of the saints that seems to be, at least from, from what Scripture teaches, something that's on you. <laughs> You've got to work at it, right? So, let's look at it. I've said enough. Bible on security. I mean, there's all kinds of verses about the fact <coughs> that God gives you, offers you, eternal life if you believe, right? And that's the main Scripture right there, John 3.16. You know, you, if you believe in Him, you're not going to perish. You're going to have eternal life. That's an ironclad, lock-solid promise in the Word of God, right? Charles, yes. Uh, in Amos, you know, earlier in chapter 3, it came to you and said, we hear that you're a teacher from God, and the explanation of that is you need more than a teacher. Yeah, you need to be born again. And, and that's a work of the Spirit of God. Jesus clearly says it in that chapter. You, you nailed it, exactly. Jesus in John 5. I'm just going to use verses from John here for a second. Uh, you know, if you hear my word, believe in, in Him who sent me, you've got eternal life. You're not going to come under judgment. You've already passed from death to life. It's a done deal. It's a done deal. The believer is eternally secure. Um, and in John 6.37, we looked at it last week in a different context. Everybody the Father gives uh, to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. Again, secure. And this is the granddaddy of them all, right? We love this passage right here. Uh, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. This is John 10, 27, 29. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. That's eternal security, right? I mean, that, that is a promise of God. Ironclad, lock solid, count on it. And there's others. And we've already mentioned this. Remember, the, the Calvinist teachers uh, kept referring to this one. You know, for those he, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to what? To salvation? No. To get to the end of this thing. He predestined you to get to the place of glorification where you become like Jesus. And then he explains the process. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. It's, it's in the past tense even, he puts it there, glorified. That hasn't happened yet for us. But it has happened from not a practical perspective, but a positional perspective. In Christ, it's a done deal. Right? Who is going to separate us from the love of Christ? And then he lists all these things. He says, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Eternal security of the believer. And a part of the sign of that promise is the seal of it, which is not a thing, but a person who comes to live on the inside of you when you receive Christ. And that is the Holy Spirit of God who comes as a down payment. And again, there's a couple of scriptures that read and then there's Philippians 1 6. God started it. He's going to finish it in you. Yeah. Yeah. So eternal security. Um, again, if you just a couple more scriptures here. 1 Peter 1 5. You're being guarded. You're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation that is already revealed in the last time. You're kept by God's power. Who's doing it? God's doing it. Now, what does this line up with? This lines up with 
the Calvinist perspective, right? It's all of God. Eternal security of the believer. It's all of God. And this is the testimony. God's given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. And He says, I've written these things so that you, you'll know that you have eternal life. You ought to have assurance because God's done it. He gave you Christ. If you have the Son, you have life, period. Done deal. And, he, and Jude, uh, you know, now to him is able to protect you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. God does this. The eternal security of the believer is on God. God does it. Okay? So, many scriptures promise the eternal security of the believer as though it all depends on God. But then there's another shoe to drop here, right? <laughs> you, you know that. Because... Not all scriptures emphasize simply God's role in this process, but focus on the other half of the process that's really up to you in it, okay? So, let's look at some of these. I've got them all jumbled up there, I'm afraid, looks like. But Jesus said, the one who endures to the end is going to be saved. Um, Paul says, I want to make it clear to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you've taken your stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold to the message I preached to you. That's a conditional statement. Right? You're looking at me like you're mad at me. Don't get mad at me. You look at Paul here and ask Paul the question. Okay, don't ask me. Don't, don't get after me about it. That's what he said. And there's way more than that, okay? Uh, Colossians. Uh, you were once alienated, hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death, talking about the cross, to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. That's glorification. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Now where are we? We talking about God's part in it? Who are we talking about? Our our responsibility. Right? We're serious about scripture here. That's all I'm saying. I, I do not just give you selected stuff. I give it all to you. So you can make your own decision about this. this is on John 47. You believe not in the writing. The scripture problem. How should you believe in my words? Okay. Um, let's look at Timothy here, 2 Timothy. He says, if we endure, we'll also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we're faithful, he remains faithful, for he can't deny himself. And then here's another one. This is out of Hebrews. There's a couple of verses out of Hebrews, and there's two ifs here. Uh, but Christ was faithful as a son over his household, and we are that household. If we hold on to our confidence and hope in which we boast, for we have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly until the end the reality that we had at the start. So apparently people are starting out with Christ, but you keep got to keep holding on till the end. Jesus said, he that endures to the end, the same will be saved. All right. Now, I'm just going to run through the seven letters that Jesus told the churches and every one of them ends with an if you will do this conditional clause essentially he says to the one who, who conquers which the assumption is you might not <laughs> but if you do I'll give you the right to the eat, of the eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God be faithful to the point of death and I'll give you the crown of life to the one who conquers or overcomes I'll give the, uh, some of the hidden banner and I'll give him a white snow, stone with a new name written on it no man knows except, except me uh, only hold on to what you have until I come and the one who conquers and keeps my works to the end I'll give him authority over the nations in the same way the one who conquers or overcomes will be dressed in white clothes and I'll never erase his name from the book of life but will acknowledge his name before my father and before his angels that raises a specter of a possibility there that I'm not going to address but if you look at it it's like whoa what <laughs> that could happen but he says, no, the one who conquers, it's not going to happen for you. Um, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The one who conquers or overcomes, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. He'll never go out again. And I'll write on him the name of my God and the city of my God, on and on. And then 
uh, the last one. To the one who conquers or overcomes, I'll give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So after reading all of that, who is it dependent on in these scriptures? On us, right? So there it is. They encourage the perseverance of the saints as though we're responsible for that. Why okay. are you there you're telling me that all these people believe in wars because wars lead to peace? Okay, I'm not sure how that relates to perseverance of the saints, yeah, but... Yeah. About conquering and stuff? Yeah, yeah. It really overcome. Overcome leads to yeah. peace. Yeah. They all yeah. believe in that. And I read that in some of my readings too. That, 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 yeah. You know, they believe in having wars. Deep. Well, the Prince of Peace, when he comes, he'll, he, it'll be peace for sure because he'll end all the wars, won't he? <laughs> That's for sure. All right, so let, let's look at this right quick because... You know, if, if we're going to be serious about Scripture, we have to acknowledge that there's some pretty thorny Scriptures in the Bible when it comes to this whole idea of what if you don't persevere? Uh, you know, what about falling away? The theological term that's used of this is apostasy, okay? Okay. Um, and, of course, Calvinist and traditional Southern Baptists say that if a person starts and doesn't finish, if they fall away, that person was never an elect person or a saved person to begin with, right? I mean, you've, you've heard that, I'm sure. Um, and all true believers will persevere to final salvation, glorification. So Calvinists and traditional Southern Baptists line up on P as far as this particular thing goes. We don't get there the same way they do because they believe in the duped doctrine as how you get to perseverance. But we end up at the same conclusion that, you know, if you're a true believer, you are, you are going to make it to the end. You're going to persevere. It's just part of what a true believer does, right? Um, now, there are other perspectives out there, obviously, and I told you that the Council of Dort was the Calvinists responding to the doctrines of the Remonstrants, or the Arminians, as we call them. And the classical Arminian position is, is since you've got free will and you don't lose it after you get saved, you don't chuck it at the door <laughs> when you receive Christ then the possibility exists for you to say, stupid though it might be, I don't want Jesus anymore. I'm done. I'm out. Yes? I was just wondering, how do you relate this to the parable of the sower? I'm getting there. Okay. Hang on. It's one of my examples. I just got to go and I want to hear it. Oh, it's one of, it, yeah, it's one of my, hang on, it's one of my examples. All right. So, an example of what you just said there. There's a guy from Knoxville named David. What's his last name? It doesn't matter. Just say David. David. Yeah. Okay. And he he has a tremendous testimony. His daughter was killed by a bunch of people. Mm. And uh, but uh, he he at one time told Jesus he didn't want him anymore. He mm. at one time told God he didn't want him anymore. Mm -hmm. And he hated he hated people and. Jesus and God, I mean, for what what happened to his daughter. But I heard him at Manly not long ago preaching, mm -hmm. pleading for people to come to Jesus, pleading yeah. for mm -hmm. salvation. Yeah. Ple you know. Yeah, now that, would, that would really doesn't fit what we're talking about here. It's actually the reverse, but the Calvinists would say, well, he, you know, the irresistible grace got him and overcame him and, and he became willing but to be become a Christian. At one time. Oh, okay, okay. That's because of the saying. death of the daughter yeah, or whatever, yeah, he, he came back. Yeah, he, well, he, I wouldn't, yeah, but, that but that's not what the classical Armenian would say. The classical Armenian would say, if you fall away, you can't come back. Yeah, but he did. You fall away, you can't come back. I don't believe that. But he didn't completely he fall didn't away, and right? And Jesus right, but he, did, he didn't completely fall away. I'm trying to argue as an Arminian because that's the point I'm trying to make. You can say Satan fell away from yeah. God, he can't come back. Yeah, right, he can't. No, that's right. Okay, so that's the classical Arminian position. There's another one out there, and Church of Christ, and, and um, you know, 
a lot of Methodist type uh, churches, Wesleyan churches might go with this um, and there are a lot of uh, uh, Assembly of God and and charismatic circles believe this and that is the Wesleyan Arminian position and that they take it even further than classical Arminian and say since you got free will you can not only leave the faith which you can't come back according to the classical Arminian but to the Wesleyan Arminian oh yeah you can you can come back multiple multiple times you may need to get saved every day you know uh, I sinned and so I gotta get resaved and I hear that a lot my, my uh, you know my CO General Boykin grew up Pentecostal, and he said, man, they had me feeling so guilty because I didn't have my hair cut above my collar and different stuff like that. I thought, man, i got to get saved every day because, uh, you know, uh, and, and so they believe that, you know, if you're an unrepentant sinner or if you're a backslidden sinner, that, you, you know, you can be lost again, but yet you can repent and be saved again. So those are the three dominant positions out there when it comes to this whole concept of falling away. Now I want to get to your scripture, okay? What about the quitters? Well, there are scriptures that seem to indicate that there are people who don't finish. They start but don't finish. And the one that you brought up, Martha, is my first example. So you, you were thinking ahead. Uh, and that's Luke chapter 8, the parable of the sower. The seed that fell on the rock are those who, when they hear and receive the word, Jesus explains that's the gospel. That's what in Mark's gospel, chapter 4 says, the devil comes and snatches it away, you know, from the, the one that falls on the hard ground. But those that fall, it falls on the rock, uh, they receive the word with joy. But having no root, these believe for a while and fall away in a time of testing. All right, here's another scripture. Remember Jesus, we, we were looking at uh, John 6, and I just went back there again uh, to pull this one. Um, there were, you know, they were listening to him teach about the fact that you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, and they were like, what in the world is he talking about? And they decided, I'm not following you anymore. Yeah. I'm not going to be a disciple anymore, right? Cannibals, yeah, exactly. Hannibal. Yeah, cannibal. Hannibal. Oh, Hannibal the cannibal, there you go. Yeah, they, they, he, he, but he was not saying literally, but they didn't get it. So Jesus said to them, uh, to the twelve, you don't want to go away too, do you? And Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and know that you're the Holy One of God. But there, there were some of the disciples, and they're named as disciples, who stopped following Jesus. As a result of the teaching, they couldn't handle it. All right, and then, you know, you got the example of Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He's deserted me, having loved this present world. Um, so there are some examples, and I, I could go way, way further than this, but I don't have time, so we've got to go with these three. And so how would a, a Calvinist traditional SBC person answer this question? And they would just put 1 John 2.19 in front of you and say, look, they never did really have it to begin with. They weren't saved to begin with. They went out from us because they were not of us. Right? 1 John 2.19. And, you know, i got to throw Adrian at you because I love this quote, right? <laughs> the faith that fizzles before the finish was flawed from the first. Yeah, that's, that's how he would answer the question right there. And I think Dean said this one before, too. So. He said it this morning. Oh, he did? Oh, I love it. That's awesome. So there you go. So you've got, uh, you've got Adrian Rogers, you know, granddaddy of the Southern Baptists there. Um, making the comment that lines up with First John two nineteen. But that does not really em encompass just uh, sinning at periods of time. Yeah. That means yeah a sustained fall away essentially. Yeah, and and we'll get to that in a second. We'll see how much I can do in five minutes. All right. So, what about the quitters? How do I explain those scriptures? Notice that it said having no root. Okay. Having no, the, these people have no root, okay? They, they believe for a while and they fall away. They didn't have the root to begin with. That goes back to the first uh, John 2.19 passage. And then, you know, the context from the other one where they said that they quit following Jesus uh, um, to his demand that they didn't get. Uh, and they said, this teaching's hard. Who can accept it? And then Jesus' perception was they didn't believe in him. They didn't believe in him, Okay. Uh, they might have been following along with the crowd, but they weren't true, 
true followers, okay? And then the last one is, Demas has deserted not Christ, but me. <laughs> you see that? Uh, having loved this present world and has gone to Thessalonica. We don't know if that guy left the faith. We just know that he he didn't hang in there with Paul when Paul's in prison and facing death. And, you know, maybe he's like uh, Mama's boy John Mark and said, I got to go home. Uh, and, but, but John Mark then became a faithful follower and disciple and one that Paul valued him being there. Maybe this was just a weak moment for Demas and not necessarily a, quote, falling away from the faith situation. So anyway, those if I were a Calvinist traditional Southern Baptist, that's how I would answer that that question. But and this is the five minutes left situation here uh, with our class. There are warnings in the scriptures to believers, and there's no question about it they're two believers, about going another way. Um, the whole book of Galatians, he says, you're, you believed a different gospel if you believe you can keep the law and be right with God. And they're about to be circumcised. You go do that? He says, just go ahead and go all the way with that. Okay, and we've taught through Galatians and you remember my teaching on that maybe, I don't know, it's been several years, but they were basically listening to the Judaizers going out of the faith and into Judaism. And he says, don't you do that. Okay. And then Hebrews, we don't know who wrote it. Could have been Paul, some people think. Definitely at least an associate of Paul because it, it just seems to resonate with his writings. Um, but that's a warning to a different group of people who are being persecuted, pressed because of their faith, he tells them you hadn't lost your life yet, but I know you're, you know, you're being pressed here. But they were being tempted to go back into Judaism. And so what he says is, look, Jesus is superior to Moses. Jesus is superior to the law. Jesus is superior to uh, Aaron, the high priest. Jesus is superior to the Jewish system. Don't go back into that. And he's writing a warning to them. Okay, And here are the two warnings as we have them and they're pretty serious warnings and I don't have a lot of time to break them down but verse 4 of chapter 5 is a tough word I just have to admit it's hard for me as a New Testament PhD knowing Greek to make this fit into a system this is where sometimes scripture busts up systems okay and this is one of those scriptures that's pretty tough, okay? That word means severed from, separated from, discharged from, loosed from. It means to, to disassociate with, okay, grace. So that is a, that's one of the scriptures that's really tough for me. Um, and then uh, the other one is this one. And that is the word one in Hebrews, and this is the granddaddy. This is the number one most contested scripture, I think, in, in the Bible when it comes to eternal security of the believer and the perseverance of the saints. Look at it. It's impossible to renew to repentance those who have fallen away. Now, who are those who have fallen away? Well, the Calvinist traditional Southern Baptists would say, well, they're not believers. They're just fake believers. But look at what it says about these people. And these are the same second heirs participles that who have fallen away are when you look at them. Once enlightened, they've tasted the heavenly gift. Well, they just took a taste. Well, it also says in Hebrews 2 that Jesus tasted death. Did he just take a taste of death? No, he went all the way. Wow. Uh, who shared in the Holy Spirit. You don't have the Holy Spirit if you're not a believer, Romans 8. Who have tasted God's good word and the powers of the coming age. And these people have fallen away. Uh, this is because of their own harm. They're crucifying the Son of God and holding him to, to contempt. So this is to, if you look at the classical Arminian, what they would say is, it is possible to apostatize, but it ain't possible to come back. Bob left and there was the one for him. Uh, it ain't possible to come back. It's impossible to renew to repentance. If you leave Jesus, you're done. 
that's what the classical Arminian says, and that's how the classical Arminian would would interpret these verses that are very thorny. The Calvinist traditional Southern Baptists would say they're not saved. Now, I, I, David Allen, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, wrote a commentary on Hebrews. He spent 50 pages on this. And the conclusion is that they're believers. He at least admits that. You can't ignore it from the Greek text. They are believers, but they're not falling away from Christ. They're just falling into sin like the wilderness generation did, which is the context of this in Hebrews. 3 and 4 talks about the wilderness generation and that they were still saved. They came out of Egypt in the Passover under the blood. They went through the Red Sea, which Paul uses as an example in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We all, like them, you know, pass through the blood and through the Red Sea as baptism. And then we got out into the wilderness and we got judged because of our lack of faith. They didn't enter the promised land, but neither did Moses. And would we say that Moses is lost? No. I mean, he, he's saved, didn't he? I mean, he's one of those that appears with Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration. And he's one of the two witnesses, I believe, in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, who's going to come back with Elijah at the, at the end. Okay, so... But still, this is a tough one. I've got to admit to you, I, I have trouble with this. It does not fit the systems, I don't think. And, and to my classical Arminian friends, I would ask this question. Okay, if you do have the free will to reject Christ after you're saved, do you still have the free will to reject Christ when you get to heaven? I mean, when you're in heaven, do you say, okay, well, I, I don't really think this is what I want to do. I'm going to reject Christ now. I mean, at what point do we stop with the free will thing? Okay, if you're born again, can you be unborn? So, I guess that's what I would say as a Calvinist, traditional Southern Baptist in response to the classical Arminian position that this this, you know, about this as apostasy. But I'm telling you, I just, it's really tough for me to deal with this passage. All right, I've got a conclusion real quick because we're, we're out of time. Okay, here it is. Many, many scriptures promise eternal security to the believer. No scripture offers assurance, eternal security to unbelievers. We can all agree on that, right? I mean, that, that is the truth. Here's the application points. If you're doubting, there's your scripture. If you're doubting your salvation, you can know. You can know that you know that you know that you're saved. And you don't have to doubt it. Okay? And then if you're complacent and you're like, I got my golden ticket. I don't really give a flip. <laughs> I'm just going to ride to heaven on my backside. No. Look at what Paul said. He says, I haven't gotten there yet. But I'm making every effort to take hold of it because I've also been taken hold by Christ Jesus. There's the tension. He's keeping me, but I'm also keeping hold myself. Do you see it? Divine sovereignty, human responsibility right there in that one verse. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. Don't sit on your butt. Keep pressing on. And then the last one is, examine yourself. <laughs> as to whether you're in the faith or not. That's what Paul says that we should do. We don't need any false assurance, that's for sure, that we're Christians if we're not. So we should examine ourselves, right? So, many scriptures promise eternal security of the believer as though it all depends on God. Many scriptures encourage perseverance of the saints as though we are responsible for it all. But here's the point. Trust the tension. Just like at the very beginning when we talked about divine sovereignty and human responsibility, you can't resolve the tension. It's both, both principles are taught in scripture. We just need to hold on to both of them. Trust God to get you there. 
but stay at it. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful truth that we find in Scripture that we are kept by the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. God, we're, we're so grateful that you hold us in your hand and nobody can pluck us from your hand. Your almighty, all-powerful devil can't touch us because we're in your hands and we're thankful for that. But Lord, I pray that most of us uh, we're probably in need of that second encouragement and that is that we need to keep pressing on just like Paul said he says that he strained every sinew every muscle every everything in his body he he left what was behind and he pressed on to what was before and that was the high call of God in the person of Jesus Christ and God I pray we'd have that kind of attitude as many as are mature he said will do that we will keep holding on to Jesus and persevere and I pray that you'll help us to do that not be complacent and not ride to hell or backside but go in dirty and bloody because we've been in the battle all the way holding on to you and God we pray that each one would examine ourselves so let the Holy Spirit check us to see do we belong to you and if not we take care of it God, we thank you for this week that we just give gratitude to you in thanksgiving for all you've done and who you are. God, we're just so grateful. You're so good to us. And we bless your holy name. Amen.